Welcome to the New America Foundation. I'm Peter Bergen, the Director of National Security Studies here. It's really a great pleasure to uh, welcome you and also our two guests, Eric Schmidt and Tom Shanker of the New York Times. Whenever I read a New York Times piece that says Eric Schmidt and Tom Shanker, I know it's going to be great. Uh, and uh, Eric and Tom has writ written this really excellent book, Counter-Strike, uh, which we're here to discuss today. Um, Eric has shared in two Pulitzer Prizes, uh, one for his coverage of Afghanistan and Pakistan, the team, um, and Tom has been covering the Pentagon uh, for, for many years. Prior to that, he was the foreign editor at the Chicago Trib Tribune, and he was the Tribune's senior uh, European correspondent covering the Bosnian War. So the way that we um, had discussed doing today's event was I would uh, essentially kind of interview um, Eric and Tom a little bit about the themes of the book for about half an hour and then throw it open to your questions. So starting at the beginning, Eric and Tom, uh, one of the uh, kind of, uh, I guess, uh, unexpected things in the book for me was this discussion in the Pentagon about uh, thinking about ways to deter terrorists, which the conventional wisdom had been is that t terrorists don't hold territory, um, they're, they don't have a return address, essentially you can't really, and also they believe they're doing God's will, at least in the case of Al-Qaeda, and therefore you cannot deter them. But I think you discovered something different. What we did, Peter, and thank you very much, by the way, for, for hosting this, and thank you all for coming. Uh, and what we looked at was, uh, there was, Peter summed it up pretty well, uh, right after 9-11 and for a couple of years afterward, there was pretty much a belief that uh, it was not possible to deter terrorists, that uh, as we saw, uh, suicide bombers and, and Al-Qaeda would, would carry out strikes, and you really couldn't think of it that way. But we found uh, in our reporting that there actually was uh, some interesting research being done in the bowels of the Pentagon by some uh, specific analysts and policy people there, and they were looking at this question, are there elements of Cold War deterrence that can be updated and adapted to go after terrorists? And what they found was, just as you said, Peter, that even though uh, terrorists, of course, stateless entity like Al Qaeda, uh, doesn't have territory that you can hold dear, such as you could the United States with the Soviet Union. There's no Kremlin, there are no military bases, there are no dachas uh, with Politburo members and their ballerinas that you could target. <laughs> but what they did discover was there are other things that the terrorist community holds dear uh, their prestige, their honor, their sense of success before the UMA, the public. Uh, in, in, in their activities. And the idea that if you could somehow target that and, and undermine that, that you could uh, at least delay or disrupt and perhaps even lessen the ferocity of these type of attacks. So this went hand in hand with a discussion about looking at terrorists as a network, not just as a vertically or, or organized uh, enemy as the tradition had been. If you could think about identifying some of these nodes in the network, and how could you maybe deter some of those nodes? Well, again, the, the, the strategists in the Pentagon who were working on this uh, said, okay, maybe you can't deter the suicide bombers or the bin Ladens, but there are a lot of people in the middle, the enablers, the supporters, the people who are the gun runners for these operations, the financiers, the logisticians. These people are, are largely in it for the money, and if you're going to take away their livelihood in some way, they're going to go somewhere else with their trade. So in the book, we talk about several examples of where they identify uh, parts of this node to essentially deter them. One of them is, for instance, looking in uh, an effort, an operation that was going on by the military in Nangarhar province in, in Afghanistan, where they looked at the hawalas. These are the ancient money trading uh, systems that are family-run businesses, essentially, that the uh, Taliban had uh, used quite extensively. And the military went in and took down about six of these family-run businesses. And this was important because it sent a message to the other remaining hawalas. It said, you have a nice home here. You've got a nice garden in the backyard, and you're providing well for your family with this business. But you saw what just happened to your friends and neighbors here? We'll do that to you, too, if you don't think about taking, uh, you can continue doing your business, but you're not going to be doing the business with the Taliban anywhere, anymore. So classic deterrence in a sense of targeting that node, but adapting it to that updated situation. Other, um, other examples that you cite in the book? Well, probably the most interesting place is um, cyberspace. Mm. Because if there is a safe haven 
where terrorists operate, as you, you know so well. It, it's on, on the internet. It's where they recruit. It's where they raise money. It's where they propagandize. It's actually also where they command and control. One of the most interesting case studies that we learned about was how you know the NSA, with its technical eavesdropping capabilities, has systems for monitoring worldwide cell phone calls to the internet for certain code words that they know that terrorists use as part of their discussions. So the terrorists, to hide their discussions, now go on to online video gaming sites, like my teenagers use at home. <coughs> because what happens at those sites, you're playing war games where the vocabulary is exactly the same as terrorist planning. So they, go, they log on at predetermined times, and they carry on their command and control discussions hidden in the vast network of online gaming. Um, but really where the military and the intelligence community are focusing their efforts is in the area of propaganda. And we've learned that uh, the military has become expert at forging the watermarks of Al-Qaeda. When Al-Qaeda puts its messages online, it has a stamp, like a watermark or a seal, to show that it's halal, that it's perfect, that it's actually Al-Qaeda talking. But the military and the intelligence community can go online, post contradictory and confusing messages that have this, you know, the bona fides of an Al-Qaeda watermark. And it just sort of confuses people and it disrupts what they're thinking. They've also become expert at hacking into uh, the cell phones of terror leaders. And they go on and they, again, they talk about, oh, the guy over there, we think he's playing funny with the money. And it just sows a, 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 a time of distrust and dissent among the groups. And then finally, one of the most interesting things the military is doing to disrupt the safe haven of the internet is Arabic speakers working for the government and the military are logging on to jihadi chat rooms. And they're posing kind of interesting questions. They're saying, well, we just read about this attack on a marketplace in Pakistan. Most of those people who were killed were Muslims. Tell me, brothers, how is this keeping with our jihadi movement to be killing innocents? And so they're trying to foment a discussion and questioning of what al-Qaeda and other terrorists are doing to sort of put off the day of a next attack. So distrust, confusion, dissent, they think achieves a deterrence effect in the end. One of the uh, other uh, things you do in the book is you kind of go down to sort of a, a level of uh, the people involved in counterterrorism that, <coughs> you know, let's say Bob Woodward would not have done, he would have kept it at the cabinet level. And so I, I was wondering if you could perhaps talk a little bit about uh, why you, how you selected the characters and who you selected, Juan Zarate, Mike Vickers, John Tyson, General Schlosser. What, what was the, other than the fact they said that yes, they would be interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> well, well you're, you're, you're right, Peter. What we were trying to do in this book is to give it some kind of narrative spine. It's gonna, it's, the, the book is organized chronologically, starting at 9-11 and ending essentially with a with the raid that killed bin Laden. And we were trying to find individuals who, as you said, were kind of below that principal level or even the deputy level that people probably had read about or maybe were writing their own books, and so they're well-known figures. But these were people really at the working level but still had a fair amount of authority. And so we, but we were also trying to find people who had experiences throughout that decade. It's mm -hmm. easy to find somebody on 9-11 who maybe was in the government but then went out of government and has stayed out of government. But we picked individuals uh, who were there throughout. So if you take uh, then Brigadier General Schlosser, Jeffrey Schlosser was in, uh, was in Kuwait on 9-11. And he had actually he had been there long enough, so he had experienced as, uh, as um, one of the military officers there the concern about al-Qaeda when they attacked the USS Cole in Aden the year before. So you watch him, and Schlosser is a commander in Iraq, Kuwait. He then comes to the Pentagon, and he's tasked by the Joint Staff to be one of the first officers at the Joint Staff level to look at this question of combating terrorism and how the military is going to be doing it. No, it's a brand new office. John Abizade, then the staff, the director of the Joint Staff, says, you're not going to be studying Eastern Europe or whatever I had in mind for you here and what you're tasked to come. This is a new assignment for you. Let's get on it. This is a month after 9-11. And we track Schlosser as he goes through. It's an interesting arc because he then uh, spends time at the, the, one of the new agencies created after 9-11, the National Counterterrorism Center, in a very important role uh, that the center plays is, the, is kind of the thinking about the, the policy operation. Uh, it's called Strategic Operational Planning uh, Arm, uh, working at NCTC, but working, thinking longer-term policy for the, uh, for the White House. 
He then is deployed overseas again, back into, uh, in, back into Afghanistan and looking at the, the region of, of uh, eastern Afghanistan. So again, he's back now on the ground, taking what he learned in government, first at the Joint Staff, then at the National Counterterrorism Center, and now he's commanding troops again, mm -hmm. uh, right on the border and influencing and talking with Pakistani commanders across the line. He then comes back and is on the Army staff here before, uh, before he ends up retiring. So, so there's one instance. The others you mentioned uh, also had really interesting careers. Juan Zarate had been at the Justice Department, had literally just been transferred over to the Treasury Department on 9-11 and becomes one of the pivotal figures in creating uh, this new focus at Treasury on combating uh, terrorist financing. You know, wh follow the money, basically, is what Juan is doing, taking his legal training, uh, and then, you know, building up both the intelligence, helping build the intelligence at Treasury, and then, uh, and then going after these networks to figure out where the money is coming so you can try and dry that up. He, of course, moves on to uh, the White House and the National Security Council where he's a senior uh, counterterrorism official in the Bush administration right up into the end. And, and obviously today still very involved uh, at CSIS and other places uh, working on the terrorism issue. So those are the kind of figures that we're doing, uh, trying to track. They have interesting histories, and they're learning, their experience is building as you kind of read through the book. Mm -hmm. John Tyson was another one. Yeah, he, he's the only person who we had to come up with a pseudonym or a nom de guerre. Yeah. Uh, he's a, a senior DIA analyst. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting, before 9-11, there were very few people in government who actually were you know, tracking al-Qaeda or knew what it was. And, not surprising, but a little embarrassing. A senior White House official confided in us that on 9 11, there were people actually walking around hearing Al Qaeda and saying, Al who? Um, so, John Tyson was uh, the original DIA analyst assigned to the bin Laden unit back when this Saudi emigre was just a big mouth with a lot of money. And before 9 11, across the U.S. government, there were so few people focused on Al Qaeda, they actually had each other's phone numbers on their speed dial. There was this cat-loving lady at the State Department, a CIA analyst, and all of that. And obviously, since 9-11, that has exploded, and, and Tyson has remade, really, the Pentagon's top bin Laden hunter up through the raid. And I think one of the things that we try to do in the book is it's, it's organized intellectually the way the military approaches the world, tactical, operational, and strategic. We, we try to find whether or not this quest for an overarching strategy to counter terrorism has been successful. I mean, during the Cold War, there was containment, there was deterrence. And so that's at the strategic level. And then operationally, we try to examine this quest to understand terrorist networks that Eric described, because the realization came that you can't capture or kill your way to victory in this campaign against violent extremism. You have to understand the networks and take apart the nodes because, again, an attempt to take down every terrorist will never happen. <coughs> and then we have some great tactical case studies, uh, young men and women in the field who are really doing the, the, the hard work. And I think those are some of the stories that we found most interesting to report, the young lieutenants, the young captains, the young intelligence analysts downrange. And they really are an untold story because, as you said, most of the books written from Washington focus on the famous names. What is your conclusion about how you know, the war went? The well, war against Al Qaeda. Well, the war against Al Qaeda, as, as you know, Peter, is not over by any means. Right. I think what we're looking, what we talk about in the book is how, uh, as we look at the issues today, of course, the Al Qaeda leadership, the core leadership in Pakistan, has been severely degraded. You know, obviously, just in the last few months, with the death of Bin Laden, the death of Elias Kashmiri, the death of the new number two in Al Qaeda, uh, Atia Abdul Rahman, and then just just the other day on 9/11 itself suitably uh, the operations <laughs> officer in Pakistan for Al-Qaeda apparently has died in another drone strike. So Al-Qaeda in Pakistan is clearly under pressure, clearly making it more difficult for them to uh, both plan and certainly carry out some type of uh, mass casualty attack as they did on 9-11, but still danger, still danger. I mean, Leon Panetta talked several weeks ago about being perhaps having Al-Qaeda in Pakistan on the cusp of, you know, being on the cusp of strategic victory. Uh, uh, against Pakistan, uh, the, the Pakistani-based al-Qaeda, and that stirred up all sorts of conversation in the intelligence community and the military uh, because they're still dangerous. There's still training camps, not camps per se, but there's still training and instruction going on in the tribal areas. And of course, in North Waziristan, 
still very much of a safe haven, not just for uh, al-Qaeda, but for the Pakistani Taliban, the TTP, and various other groups uh, where the Pakistani military, even though it's based there in Miram Shah, is not deployed in, in, in operations. And that's where we see the focus of the drones taking in. The other concern, obviously, though, is the, is the proliferation and the, and the rise of the affiliates, uh, yeah. both in North Africa, in uh, East Africa, and most notably in, in Yemen. Uh, the Yemeni arm, known as al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, is the arm, of course, that was responsible for the so-called underpants bomber, a young Nigerian man in Christmas of 2009 who tried to blow himself up aboard the commercial airliner in Detroit, luckily failed. Uh, also, 10 months later, the group that was responsible for packing uh, printer cartridges full of explosives, putting them on cargo planes, uh, likely bound for Chicago. That plot also thwarted, thanks to some help with the, from the Saudi intelligence. So I, I think what we're seeing here is a, is a, is a nimble, uh, more resilient uh, adversary, particularly, uh, particularly here in the affiliates. And then there's the concern about the homegrown threat here in the United States, still very small. Uh, but the concern that individuals here in the U.S. can be radicalized over the Internet, particularly by an individual like Anwar al-Awlaki, an American-born cleric, now in hiding in, uh, in, uh, in Yemen, but who, had, uh, but who was clearly operating here in the United States. He operated in mosques here in northern Virginia and in San Diego. And then, as you point out, Peter, in your very good recent paper uh, that was done with Andrew Leibovich in Syracuse, it's not just Muslim extremists that are concerned but also other groups here in the United States, uh, right-wing groups, or right-wing individuals even, uh, such as we saw with the, uh, with the individual in Norway. Uh, and so, so I think there's this, this shift away from maybe th the worry that about the big-scale attack may have lessened, but there's still very much a concern about the smaller-scale attack that could be carried out. Yeah, I, I, I guess to answer, you know, how are we doing, how does it end, the, the one takeaway I would share with those of you who haven't read the book is that Ten years of counterterrorism <coughs> efforts by the U.S. government have been able to put off the day of the next attack and perhaps to have lessened the severity. But the next attack is going to come. And, and the real key value here is for the U.S. government and the people of this nation to adopt a strategy <coughs> of resilience, not unlike in the U.K. or in Israel. And it goes beyond infrastructure resilience to rebuild, but it's a whole attitude about how we as individuals pick up the next day and carry on. Um, you know, Eric mentioned the printer cartridge attack from Al-Qaeda in Yemen. Uh, it failed, but it was a strategic victory because the cargo industry shut down for a few days. Tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars had to be spent to re repair that. And Al-Qaeda in Yemen bragged that whole effort cost just $4,200. So the strategy is sort of throwing pebbles into the cogs of the Western economy. And only by understanding that and adapting and carrying on after the next attack can we deny terrorists a strategic victory out of their tactical defeats. Um, it's hard enough to write a book uh, by yourself, but it, is it doubly hard to write it as a team? Or how did you sort of divide up the work and how did you, did you avoid, you know, you're still friends, obviously. <laughs> So how did that work? Sure. Well, well, fortunately, Tom and I have been colleagues for, for more than 10 years at the times. We were partners at covering the Pentagon for six years. Uh, I came back from a leave and uh, covering terrorism, and we picked right up where we left off. And this really, this, this book is the result of an, a page one article that appeared in the Times about three and a half years ago. From that, uh, we drafted a book proposal uh, and then launched on this project. And the way we went about it was uh, in the chapter structure, uh, each of us took a lead. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, the area that we happened to be covering or our personal interest, uh, we would take the lead at writing the first draft, and then we'd swap it back mm -hmm. to, the, to our partner. And we did this throughout the process. Uh, we were under a very tight schedule. We were aiming to try and get this out just before the 9-11 anniversary, uh, which we were able to do. We also did most of this, uh, with the exception of a, a short and very profitable uh, leave of absence to do some writing on our own time. So it was kind of juggling uh, this and you know, for, fortunately, that much of the subjects we're covering, particularly as we get down toward the end, uh, track with our day jobs as well. But uh, but it was an intense period. Yeah, I mean the hardest part was time management because again, Eric and I have a very easy working relationship. We know each other's habits and and we do have complementary expertise. And what we found at the end is that if we gave eighty percent of our time to the book, 
80% to our jobs, 80% to our spouses, 80% <laughs> to our kids. Everything left over was just for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, and how did you, you know, th how do you deal um, as New York Times reporters with writing a book where you're getting little bits of things which might be good for the book, but maybe they're good for the paper, or and is the paper of sort of pressuring you to put stuff in the paper before it goes in the book, or how does that work? Because yeah, I can see that. Guy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so what we did was basically our rule of thumb was, was there, if there was information that we got that we knew wouldn't hold until our publication date, uh, we would put that in the paper. And so right. there were a couple of instances where we, we put stories in the paper looking on, along those lines. And then toward the end of the, of the end of the process, for instance, we had a whole interesting uh, story about the hunt for bin Laden and the, the time they thought they almost had him. Mm. That is, they thought they had some in intelligence that put him across, across the border in a place called Tora Bora, actually, uh, in 2007, I think. And the, the military put so much stock in this intelligence that they ramped up what was then going to be the largest single air raid uh, since the beginning of the, of the Iraq war. I mean, they were going to throw the kitchen sink at this place in Tora Bora. The symbolic significance was not lost on anybody in the mm -hmm. government. Uh, as well as a full-blown commando operation that was going to go up and try and collect the so-called squirters if anybody tried to get out. Uh, this went right down to the end. They actually had B-2 bombers in the air flying from, uh, flying from Diego Garcia. Diego Garcia. Diego. We did say that in the book, I'm yeah. sure we said that. <laughs> uh, and, and, and at the very end, the intelligence was deemed not to be either credible enough or, the, or Bin Laden was tipped off to it or whatever it was. But uh, the meeting took place, but it was on a much smaller scale. The commanders actually turned the B-2s uh, around and had them fly back on to, uh, back on to base. Uh, but it was an instance like that. So after, after bin Laden was killed, obviously we're not going to sit on that for the book anymore. So we broke that out. We put that uh, story in the paper. And luckily, Bin Laden was killed before you closed the actual manuscript, right? Describe uh, what that was like. Well, it was very interesting. One of our readers, uh, if you ever write a book, I highly recommend you find people who care enough about you to read the book, but don't care enough not to hurt your feelings, because you really want to have people murder board it. One of our, our readers uh, gave us some helpful <coughs> critique along the way, and this was probably in mid-April, and he said, it's a pretty good book, but you need some kind of ending. <laughs> <laughs> so we turned in the manuscript, literally the deadline, the book was done the last Friday in April, and uh, within 48 hours they'd gotten bin Laden. So Eric and I and the entire national security team at the Times worked around the clock that entire week. What happened? What does it mean? Some good tactical stories and all of that. And the following weekend, uh, our publisher at Times Books and Henry Holt literally stopped the, the, the presses for us. And Eric and I spent four days doing interviews, going back to our sources, strong-arming officials, and we wrote a new concluding chapter with some interesting and exclusive stuff about the raid itself. We freshened up the prologue. We freshened up the epilogue. And actually, one of the hardest things was going through the entire manuscript for verb tenses, because bin Laden was no longer an is. <laughs> he was a was. <laughs> um, the, uh, there are some events in Iraq which you uh, talk about uh, as being kind of pivotal. And I guess one thing is the discovery of the documents in Taji. Can you explain why that was so important? The Tanji raid was, was significant. This was one of the many commando raids that was being carried out by the uh, Joint Special Operations Forces. And uh, they came across, uh, really, in, uh, in a raid, uh, you know, I should say, the, the Joint Special Operations Force were carrying out raids all the time. But this one was, uh, well, this one was a little bit different. Uh, this happened to be a, uh, on a conventional uh, infantry patrol. Uh, they came across a car in one of their patrols that looked a little bit odd, out of place. and. Um, and when the driver got out of the car, he, fl he fled, eventually self-detonated, blew himself up. But the man left inside the car had a valise with him, a suitcase, briefcase. And in that, after uh, they checked and made sure it wasn't a, a bomb or an IED or anything, uh, they discovered basically what was the Al-Qaeda campaign plan, Al-Qaeda in Iraq campaign plan for how to counter the surge uh, that the United States was now starting in early 2007. And, and among the interesting things in, the, uh, in this document, besides obviously where they intended to move some of their uh, the militant forces was what the focus was going to be on. Uh, one of the focus, for instance, was going to be the targeting the bakeries, the people who bake the bread. 
uh, which was basically you know, one of the daily staples of Iraqis. And if you could somehow cut off that supply and show people that they couldn't even get one of their basic staples every day, they were going to target the garbage collectors uh, and allow garbage to pile up in the streets of Baghdad to show mm -hmm. again how the, uh, the Iraqi government and the United States would not be able to uh, not be able to basically carry out the most essential functions of a, of a government like that. So with this, armed with this, uh, General Ray Odierno was able to effectively counter much of this, and, uh, and it became you know, essential, one of the essential parts mm -hmm. of the campaign in dealing with and addressing, combating uh, the Al-Qaeda in Iraq's uh, strategy there in the capital. Because part of that was also the, the so-called belt strategy, right, that they would be encircling mm -hmm. Baghdad, and I guess Odierno went and sort of d dismantled the belt. That was one of the conclusions, I think, right, mm -hmm. of the Taji mm -hmm. documents. That's right. He actually found hand-drawn maps by Zarqawi mm -hmm. that, that showed how al-Qaeda in Iraq, although it was a terrorist organization, was actually <coughs> going to mount some campaigns like a conventional force with a hierarchy and all of that, and it allowed Odierno to reposition his forces ag against the al-Qaeda forces. And another interesting historic footnote um, there was a lot of talk about whether the um, Saddam's holdovers were in any way cooperating with al-Qaeda in Iraq and whether it was coincidental or whether some had crossed over. Many of the lines of attack that were found on Zarqawi's map mirrored the Iraqi army's plans for defending Baghdad from American mm -hmm. attack. What about the Sinjar documents? Yeah, the Sinjar raid is, is one of my favorite case studies in, in the book. Um, Sinjar is this dusty town in western Iraq along the Syrian border, and it was a major rat line for the entry of foreign fighters, those who wanted to come to make jihad and fight, and in particular, the suicide bombers. I mean, it's interesting to note that very few Iraqis were suicide bombers. They actually wanted to live and have their country and, and take it back, but there were a lot of foreign jihadis who came in, and this was a time when suicide bombs were literally knocking back American and Iraqi forces. I mean, General Petraeus told us that during this period, it was like being in the 50th round of a boxing match, and he was taking all of the hits. So the American military had just put a brute force intelligence effort over this dusty camp at Sinjar. It was predators and J-stars and all that, and they established what they call a pattern of life who comes, who stays when they leave. And they knew the night that the emir of this area, the al-Qaeda emir, was passing through with some future suicide bombers. And so the Joint Special Operations Command mounted a raid. They went in fast, they went in hard, the kind of thing they do very well now. And even though a lot of the, the terrorists there self-detonated, uh, they were able to retrieve just a, a treasure trove of documents and computer drives and all of that. And it became known as an Al-Qaeda Rolodex because, as one of our sources told us, it was fortunate that Al-Qaeda was as anal about documentation as were the Nazis. So they had copies of the passports of all those who'd come in to be suicide bombers, their hometowns, uh, who had inspired them or who had recruited them. And what it showed is that there were ink spots from where a lot of the suicide bombers were coming from that wasn't evenly spread across the Middle East. They were especially coming from Saudi Arabia and from Libya, which was very, very interesting. So they'd taken out the rat line for a while, but what to do with all of this incredible information because the suicide bomber threat would, of course, reconstitute somewhere. It's a fact in the military that whoever uncovers the intelligence, owns the intelligence. So all the Sinjar documents belong to a fellow you might have heard of named Stanley McChrystal, who at the time was in charge of all the special operations forces. And McChrystal was really a, you know, a, a visionary in understanding how you had to flatten the American military and intelligence to make our networks mirror the flexibility and the agility of terror networks. So he said, I'm going to unilaterally declassify a vast bulk of this treasure trove push it out across the intelligence community. He gave a big part of the documents to a, an exploitation team uh, at Special Operations Command that was called Redbeard. They handed it over to the Countering Terrorism Center at West Point to do some magazine articles and some essays for the public to read. But even that wasn't amplifying this enough. So the information was collated, the names were tracked, and it was divided into country-by-country country portfolios and given to a fellow at the State Department who was the new ambassador for counterterrorism. And interestingly enough, he had been Admiral McChrystal's predecessor at the Joint Special Operations Command. His name was Del Daly. 
Well, now an ambassador daily went to all of the countries in the Middle East and North Africa that were the source point for the suicide bombers. Mm -hmm. And he met with the intelligence officers, the top diplomats, the law enforcement, military. He could use his, his general's background if he needed to. He could use his diplomatic cred if he needed to. When he said to them, this is honest to goodness information. This is not American propaganda. These are al-Qaeda documents that show that suicide bombers are coming from your country. The jihadi fighters are coming from your country, transiting through Syria to make war in Iraq. You may think this is our problem, but let me tell you, the suicide bombers won't come back but the jihadi fighters will, and you will have an incredible problem on your hands. And the data was so compelling that the suicide bombing rate dropped by 85% within six months. And General Petraeus credits that diplomatic mission with halting suicide bombing in Iraq more than any of the military operations. And it shows how the whole of government has to work together to really counter violent extremism. Um. You said that you got some exclusive stuff about the hunt for bin Laden. What, what, are you, what, what, what did you learn that wasn't out there already? You know, it, it's, some of this has now come out before right. in some of, the, some of the articles. It's quite detailed, but I think what we had, we had talked about was, for instance, as you go in, one of the reasons why that helicopter went down, that first helicopter, was the unusual how warm it was that evening in Abbottabad. It was much warmer than they had planned on, that they had practiced for. And as that first helicopter that, uh, that came in uh, was hovering over the compound, it created this unusual uh, wind tunnel almost effect that mm -hmm. the uh, that helicopter pilots feared when they hover over an enclosed uh, space. And it, uh, it basically, you know, you lose the lift that you need to have there. And you can compensate for that if you know these things. But as that, plane, that helicopter came down, of course, uh, you, you had the first the first problem in, in the raid itself, which the SEALs had to then modify to. One of the other things we talk about, though, in, in, the, in the book I on that raid, Peter, is, is the uh, tremendous operational security that uh, bin Laden uh, used uh, in that. And obviously, it's been well reported that he had no, you know, there were no uh, internet, no television, no, no signal essentially coming from that compound that you could detect. But he was so careful about this that, that people who came to visit him, these small number of couriers and others who came to visit that compound, not only were they required to check their cell phones at the door and turn them off, but he required that they take out the SIM cards to those uh, cell phones several miles away so they couldn't mm -hmm. be tracked if anybody was watching them or watching the signal coming off of that. Uh, so there was uh, little details like mm -hmm. that that kind of give you insights both into operationally how, how this was working uh, as, as, well as, uh, as well as bin Laden's own steps. And, and of course, the, the, the questions that were raised afterward, he seemed to be so lightly guarded. Well, you know, after many years there, no doubt he had a certain sense of complacency had probably set in. I, I think for the full story, we'll have to wait for your book right. when it comes out next, <laughs> no, no. next year. But I, I think since we were writing for history, one of the uh, things that hadn't been written about before our book, which I found very fascinating, was the incredible amount of planning that went into the bin Laden raid for what could go wrong and what could go right. And in fact, when all of the principals were sitting in the sit room that night, they had in front of them what they called the playbook. And it was a three ring binder, probably four inches thick. And it was all about the what ifs. What if he, uh, bin Laden was captured alive? And they had military JAG standing by. They had interrogators standing by. They knew which aircraft would take him to which ports and then to which ships for interrogation. And, and they truly were anticipating everything one of the last minute changes that we reported for the first time is that after the president decided to go with the commando raid as opposed to a large bomber strike or a predator strike that might obliterate any chance of identifying DNA, he posed the question, what happens if your operational security is detected not by bin Laden but by the Pakistanis? And so at the last minute, mm. they crafted a fight your way out strategy, as painful as that would have been with our quasi-ally Pakistan. And that's when additional helicopters were added to, to increase the size of the package in case the initial team was, uh, was discovered by local police or even the army. And they were ready to fight their, their way out to get bin Laden out. Just uh, one final question before we throw it open to the audience. Um, you know, Pakistan is a place you spent a lot of time, Eric, and Tom, obviously, you've reported on it, and, uh, and in a sense, it's the heart of all the, the issue. How do you see, um, it seems to me that in the U.S. military, there is a certain group that um, might, might want to move to a policy of containment with Pakistan, 
as opposed to an alliance. Uh, and um, clearly, you've, it's been reported that Cameron Munter, the ambassador, you know, really pushed back, uh, uh, in particular on one particular drone strike that was March 17th after the release of Raymond Davis and was essentially overruled by the CIA. How do you, uh, so from a Pakistani perspective, it seems that there are multiple competing agendas that the US government has, which I think is probably true. The State Department has one view, CIA has another, DOD has another. How do you see our relationship, America's relationship with Pakistan developing in the future? I mean, has it, uh, there was obviously this huge rupture after bin Laden, which was accumulation of Raymond Davis and the drones. Based on your sort of reporting now, do you think things are better on a working level or worse, or um, is this just going to be bad for the foreseeable future? What's your? I, I think, Peter, what we've seen, starting with, uh, obviously, even before Raymond Davis, there were tensions over the drone strikes and other other incidents, but, but from Raymond Davis on through the capture, the, the death of bin Laden uh, to, to today, I mean, I think what you've really seen now is, I think the relationship pretty much has bottomed out, at least as right. bottomed out as it's going to be in the last few decades. It's actually been interesting to watch and listen in the last few weeks uh, that the name calling and finger pointing seems to have quieted down, and my sources tell me that's a deliberate effort on both, on the part of both sides. And in fact, when the Pakistanis announced uh, the death of this number two, this new number two Al Qaeda leader, uh, they took an unusual step to help credit the CIA for providing some of the information in that. And the CIA was fully prepared to not hear anything about this, and they would have considered that a victory. But the, the fact that the Pakistanis went out of their way in their in their statement that they put out to credit the Americans for help seemed to be a baby step toward rebuilding this relationship. Now that said, in talking to people who, for instance, who work uh, in and around Admiral Mullen, uh, who's really the American point person for Pakistan. He's met with General Kayani more times than anybody, anybody else in the government. He's meeting with him again shortly on the fringes of a, of a conference in Spain uh, before mm -hmm. he retires at the end of this month. Uh, the, the concern within these people who work closely with Pakistan is uh, it's going to take several months, if not more than a year, to get back to where we were with even at the point of the Raymond Davis uh, hmm. strike. Uh, if, it, if it ever gets that back to that level, and that, that even at that level was pretty low. I mean, right now, you, the United States is still holding back what they call coalition support funds. These are the monies that the United States has agreed to reimburse Pakistan for their operations uh, in and along the border, and the 100,000 or more troops that are there. Uh, basically conducting what the U.S. and Pakistan say are counterterrorism operations. Uh, there have been complaints that this money hasn't been delivered on time in the past because the Pakistanis not providing the proper accounting receipts. This time, however, Secretary of State Clinton has said, we're just holding it back until we see some commitment on your part, you, the Pakistanis, that you're truly committed to not only rooting out al-Qaeda, but many of these other groups uh, that you've written so much about over the years, Peter. And we're looking at the Pakistani Taliban and the Haqqani network, which is perhaps the biggest thorn in the side of this relationship, and one of the groups that the Pakistanis really are, are protecting in North Waziristan, and which are the leading killer of American and other NATO troops in Afghanistan, where they're from, and are, are now being, uh, being blamed and uh, attributed for this most recent attack, uh, this 19-hour attack uh, upon the uh, NATO and U.S. Uh, compound in Kabul. So as we look at the United States beginning to withdraw its forces, there's a lot of concern over Pakistan continuing to play this double game of perhaps uh, helping or at least complicitly, implicitly uh, supporting the CIA drone strikes in the tribal areas, but also supporting some of the militant groups on the other side as they look in a long-term way at supporting groups that will be their strategic hedge against India, their traditional rival and ally to the uh, enemy to the east. And they're looking beyond the day when the United States leaves uh, in pa Afghanistan, or at least leaves in significant numbers, uh, to prevent the kind of deterioration in Afghanistan they saw the last time major powers left then after the, after the Soviet War. Uh, we'll take some questions. If you could uh, wait for the microphone and identify yourself, we'll start with Christina Lam, son, Sunday Times. Hi, um, a couple of questions. One, you talked about the fact that bin Laden's killing gave you an ending to the book, 
I wondered if you could be honest <laughs> how in the book prior to that whether you'd thought that they were close to getting bin Laden or not. Um, and then the second question, you talked about the recent successes that the US has had in killing senior Al-Qaeda people. Um, do you think that's a result of information that was found in the raid? You talked about Al-Qaeda being kind of anal in keeping, in documenting things, or, or how has the US managed to have those successes recently? Thank you. Um, to your first question, um, bef that Friday when we <coughs> turned in the manuscript, we had no idea they were on the cusp of a, of a raid to get bin Laden. It was one of the most closely held secrets uh, in Washington. Uh, even people who were chopping on the intelligence that we talked to subsequently didn't know who the target was. People who were working, you know, fueling and routes and all, all that sort of stuff. I, I think, though, our, our overall conclusions didn't change at all as far as where we are in this campaign. Um, which is that, you know, terrorism, counterterrorism is really the new Darwinism. You know, the American side has gotten better, uh, but the adversaries are a learning uh, an enemy as well. And that while the death of bin Laden uh, was necessary to crippling al-Qaeda, it, it's not sufficient. And as Eric described, uh, the terror threat remains uh, very serious today, but just in a different form. Al-Qaeda Central still wants a weapon of mass destruction for mass casualty or mass effects. The affiliates, especially in Yemen, are viewed as more uh, dangerous today than Al-Qaeda Central. And General Carter Ham, who heads the American Africa Command, told us just earlier this week that he's seeing a new syndicate forming among the terror groups based in Africa, where there are vast un ungoverned areas. And that while they have not previously shown the capability to strike outside their areas. Uh, this syndication is a new and, and worrisome threat. So even though we had no way of knowing how close America was to bin Laden, I, I think his death was a dramatic ending to our book, but didn't really change our analysis of what the next 10 years will look like. And I think just to answer the second part of your question, I think, well, they, I think the intelligence people that I've talked to uh, have said that the, the documents they took out of uh, out of the uh, about about house, say less about current operations than the than where Bin Laden's head was. I mean, what what was he thinking in terms of the next attack? How was he communicating with his subordinates? The frustration that he had uh, that they weren't able to uh, to kind of carry out uh, the kind of large scale attack along the against the United States or the West that he was hoping. Um, and you know, I mean, I mean, there may no doubt there were certain nuggets and elements that they've been able to pull together and piece together. But I think. In terms of the most recent success, I think that's really a culmination of a number of things. One is the CIA has been able to build a very effective uh, network of informants of their own on the ground. They haven't used ISI informants in many years because, frankly, most of, the t most of those informants, uh, when the information was being passed about a drone strike, was passed on to the, was passed on to the militants a few, you know, a few hours beforehand. So it's taken a lot of time. Uh, they've suffered certain casualties. But I think that network in itself has become quite effective. The other thing you have to remember is after bin Laden's death, there's all this confusion about what happens. You know, where's the, who's the next leader going to be? I mean, Zawahiri eventually surfaces as people expected to be the new number one. But I think there's been a fair amount of chatter, uh, as the intelligence community calls it, that's been, they've been able to listen to and detect. There's been certain emails that have been going around. Their operational security has probably suffered somewhat in this confusion as people try, as members of the network, uh, try and mm. right themselves and figure out where are we here, who's communicating with whom, particularly with Zawahiri, who was really off on his own a little bit. That was kind of one of the other interesting uh, uh, insights into the bin Laden uh, documents was how bin, it was really bin Laden and Atiyah kind of working together with the affiliates Although Zawahri made many more statements, he was in a place apparently where he could do that. It was actually bin Laden and then Atiyah who seemed to be more connected to the affiliates than Zawahri necessarily was on an operational level, which is interesting. So you disrupt not only bin Laden now, but then you get Atiyah, and it's even more disruption in this network. And the intelligence community loves disruption like that because the, <laughs> one, one, one of the hallmarks of this campaign that we write about over the 10 years is how the American and Western intelligence communities have been able to take this vast amount of information that they glean from various informants, but also from spy satellites and all the eavesdropping platforms they have now, and crunch it through supercomputers and turn that information around into leads that then they can hand to these operators, the people 
uh, on the ground who like uh, like the Bin Laden raid. I mean, these are you know more than a dozen raids like this every night in Afghanistan alone. They're now able to turn that information around much more quickly. So they're hitting safe houses before the militants even know that their buddies have been picked up or killed. Uh, they don't have as much warning as they did in the past. So I think it's kind of a combination of a, lo a lot of things that has led to this success. And as, as more people are killed, I think it also, it also helps uh, those and all the money that the CIA is spreading around. Suddenly you have informants who kind of are looking at the writing on the wall and said, maybe now is the time to come in you know, from the cold and help out while I still have a, you know, a chance before the, the next missile is coming for me. By the, the picking up on that, the, uh, the raid in Quetta that netted this guy Mauritania had lost, I guess, two Fridays ago, which was a joint Pakistani-U.S. That's right. Um, yeah, uh, what is going to happen to him? In the sense that, I mean, it's hard. I mean, would, is he going to go to Guantanamo? Is, will he be interrogated? You know, do we have a sense? Because this is the first time that a relatively high-value person has been actually arrested in Pakistan, probably the last time was in 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, since then, it's all been drone strikes. So this is kind of a, and w how is the Obama administration positioned to deal with somebody like that from a sort of in its legal framework? I mean, who would interrogate him? Where would he go? How would he be handled? Um, and just thank you for correcting me on that, yeah. Peter, because that was, it was not a Tia, this statement came out, it was after Mauritania's yeah. capture that was so significant when the, uh, when the Pakistanis credited the CIA. I think you've raised a really important question now, where if, if, an, if an individual like this is captured, not in Afghanistan, not in Iraq, uh, what happens? We, we saw in one case this guy Warsami, mm. uh, who was the go-between between the Somalia Shabaab and AQAP, he's caught at sea, and uh, he's picked up and eventually sits on a Navy ship for several weeks before they finally bring him you know, to New York before anybody knows what's happening. I think in this case, we're, we're still waiting to see how this is going to mm. play out because the administration does not have a policy uh, in place right now to how you deal with these. They're, it's dealt with on an ad hoc basis, individual case by case. So the question is, will they, will they let the Pakistanis hold him for a while? Will they allow the uh, CIA access to him for questioning? Uh, will they at least provide you know, questions that they can be that can be asked of him by the ISI, and that's going to be an interesting uh, signal to see where this U.S.-Pakistan relation goes in terms of the coordination that they they have on this. But where he ends up, I I would s strongly strongly doubt he would end up at Guantanamo Bay. Everybody I talk to within the U.S. Justice Department says that ain't happening. <laughs> We're not putting in any more people there. So where does that leave it? We see that every time they bring somebody to New York or the United States, we see you know, the hue and cry from, from the Hill and other places about what that means in terms of in how you try them. Um, is there a possibility that you could somehow reopen a, uh, a prison in, in Afghanistan for these guys? You hear some talk of that. But for the most part, I think the strategy now, if you want to call it that, is we are going to hopefully have a number of allies who will capture these individuals, hold them, allow us either access to them or questions to them, and we'll kind of have to work out the details later in terms of how you prosecute them. And just just uh, identify yourself when you ask a question. Yeah, my name is Bi Yang uh, from Montgomery County, Maryland. Uh, I tried to compare with history and then with the domestic uh, U.S. policy or their practices. For one thing is that if you can define <coughs> hero or tyranny or enemies, depending on which side you are talking about. So we are thinking about if you say terrorists, whether they are really terror by good sense and uh, is wrongfully labeled by the CIA or FBI or whatever agency or multi-corporations. The second is uh, the CIA or FBI or any government agency or corporation, they usually label wrongly against anybody, anti-corporation, uh, co corruption, or anti-conspiracies, or send them to jail, or torture, send them to Okay. Uh, Guantanamo okay, so Bay. I think the question is... Um, Two questions. Uh, one is compared to the history, but what's the real reason that Al-Qaeda or 
uh, terrorist would behave that way, but it is a revenge against uh, U.S. policy or the w their victimization against their own population. Sure, thank you very Second much. Second, okay. okay. yeah, yeah. unjust right. purposes. Thanks. Uh, you know, it's a, a great set of questions, and I, I think, you know, it's just because something's a cliche doesn't mean it's, it's not true. Uh, you know, one man's uh, guerrilla is, an, is another man's freedom fighter. So to be sure, perspective is important. I, I, I think, though, that Eric and I would not lose our journalistic, journalistic objectivity to say that groups who routinely uh, murder innocents, even of their own faith, uh, are probably carefully classified as terrorists, uh, fair enough. Um, at the same time, this nation does have as, as its obligation uh, our own millennial goal, which is to eradicate uh, the poverty uh, that is a root cause of, of terrorism, the poverty of hope, the lack of, of education, all those things. But that is really a millennial global challenge. And in the meantime, I think it, the government has made a decision that it, it will continue with intelligence operations, military operations, and diplomatic efforts to contain and defeat violent extremism. In um, your, obviously you reported throughout the Bush two terms, and now you've had the, the uh, two and a half years of the Obama. Uh, are you, the people you talk to surprised about the Obama presidency in terms of, say, the drones, the tripling, you know, the, 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 you know, the not just continuity but with Bush, it's actually amplification in some cases. Well, then there has been some discontinuity. So is that, was that a sort of surprising thing for you, writing the book and reporting on it? You, I think it was a surprise for most people. And certainly, the, the, I think the, the Democratic base that was Obama's uh, principal supporters in the election, I think, you know, here was a guy who campaigned certainly of ending the war in Iraq, but also he was going to, you know, increase the commitment to Afghanistan. I think what, what threw people was, the idea that he was also going to, as you said, double down on the covert operations. I mean, there was uh, very clearly a spike in the number of drone attacks uh, by various measurements. Uh, the, his first year in office in 2009, uh, Obama ordered, the C, you know, the CIA carried out more drone strikes in Pakistan than in all eight years of, of Bush's administration. And in 2010, that figure more than doubled again. It's down slightly this year for various reasons including some of the sensitivities around Raymond Davis and other things, and, and trying not to irritate the relationship. But it really showed that this president is, is how he can sometimes, uh, you know, he's streaked, he's, he's, he's labeled in the domestic political reign uh, as, as somebody who's trying to conciliate or trying to negotiate in the middle. And here he's taken these very dramatic steps of, of directing increased uh, covert operations, drone strikes, and of course the bin Laden raid itself uh, based on his own acknowledgement that at best, the intelligence community, this is after staring at that compound for months and months, putting every asset they could on it, still uh, the assessment was roughly 50-50 that bin Laden was there. And given all the risks that Tom talked about, um, I think a lot of people um, in the military, in the, in the intelligence community and others uh, have been su pleasantly surprised from their view at how aggressive uh, the president has been. Um, that said, of course, uh, the president has brought a whole new orientation uh, that he laid out in his Cairo speech of how terrorism was not going to be the only lens through which American foreign policy was, was conducted. It was an important pillar along with many other things. Um, but that, uh, that, that you can't you know, carry out relations, foreign relations with a number of countries, particularly in the Muslim world and the Middle East, through that vehicle alone. This gentleman over here. Thank you. <coughs> I'm uh, Chris Harmon with Marine Corps University. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. And I enjoyed the talk and, and look forward to the book. Uh, during the period you cover, there wasn't a national strategy for counterterrorism yet from Mr. Obama. There were two from Mr. Bush, 2003 and 2006. You were covering the Pentagon. You're covering the war. I'd be very interested in your views of those documents by the Bush White House. Thank Sh you. Sure. Uh, that's a wonderful question. Thank you. Because one of the <laughs> early drafts of our, our manuscript so focused on the, the strategy and the documents that our, our editor said, no, this book has to be about people, not about paper. Uh, but <laughs> but you're, you're, and he was absolutely right. Um, but your question's a terrific one. It is addressed in great detail in the book. 
Uh, the first of the strategy documents you mentioned said flat out, terrorists who are willing to give up their lives for their cause are undeterrable. The second of the documents you mentioned, the language was all already changing to say that there may be aspects of deterrence that can be brought to bear. And then I guess the final document you didn't mention is the national military strategy signed out by Admiral Mullen earlier this year formally and officially adopts deterrence as we've described it as part of American counterterrorism strategy. So the evolution of thinking is, is part of official documentary strategic uh, thinking now for all to re review and analyze. As somebody who's covered the Pentagon for so long, um, to what extent is there a relationship between a strategic document like this and actual action on the battlefield, or is it? Uh, you know, that's, that's another great question. To be sure, the, the Marine Rifle Company commander doesn't stop and pick up the NMS and flip through it for <laughs> guidance. Um, the strategy documents do prove a value, though, because by specifically addressing a president or the chairman or the secretary's priorities, they focus the bureaucracy. They focus energy, they focus money, they focus priorities, and those then trickle down through the system to affect what resources that rifleman has, the kind of mission he's given, what he's supposed to be, to be doing. So there, there is a, a, a membrane linking the strategic through the operational down to the tactical. How do you guys assess uh, the changes at the top of DOD and, and at CIA and the fact that there are a lot of JSOC type folks who are now got senior positions or various places in the government? How do you see things changing, or if, if at all, with this new group in charge? Well, I think w certainly you've got very interesting personalities kind of moving around. They're players that are well known within this administration, but in new places. If you look at General Petraeus, that's going to be one of the most interesting places to watch as you take all his operational experience uh, as a commander in Iraq and then in Afghanistan as a consumer of an intelligence, but working very closely uh, with the intelligence community over this past decade. And now he's running the show at the CIA. I think he's going to put that building on notice pretty, pretty quickly uh, and be testing them, be testing their assumptions every day in what he does. And I think it's, it, it's going to be an interesting relationship because that building has eaten other, other new directors alive when they mm -hmm. come in. But I think Petraeus is coming in, obviously, with a lot of public support, uh, is the most acclaimed general officer, mil senior military officer of his generation. He's got a lot of support on the Hill. And you know, he's, there's still people over at the White House who are wary of him. That may be why he'd be, he was put at the, White, at the CIA rather than allowed to roam around in the political realm. But I think in, in the end, he still has a fair amount of support there, too. Um, I'll let Tom talk about Secretary Panetta, though. Sure, just one other point first. Eric and I had a story a couple of weeks ago that talked about <coughs> how the 10-year campaign against violent extremism has really changed military culture. And one of the most significant ways is that senior officers of the special operations community are now being salted across the conventional force in ways that never would have happened to a snake eater before 9-11. I mean, you have a SEAL uh, a head of Special Operations Command. Okay, fair enough, that's where they, they live. But you also have a SEAL as the number two officer at Central Command over the entire Middle East. You have a SEAL as the number two officer at Southern Command for all of Latin America. Uh, truly historic. Uh, as far as Secretary Panetta, I, I think it's interesting, even though Eric and I cover you know, the war on terrorism, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, it's worth remembering that Gates was brought in by President Bush to solve the war in Iraq. He was kept on by President Obama to fix Afghanistan, but Panetta's war is really going to be against Congress and the executive branch over money. And, and that will really define his tenure. To be sure, money translates directly into strategy, but I would bet that more of Panetta's day will be spent looking at ledgers than looking at uh, strategy documents. In the front, Mr. <coughs> Hi, Shelton Williams. Um, you began by saying that the resilience of the American people and their, uh, their ability to absorb and react and move on from a, a, a terrorist strike might be the most important lesson of your book, which I've already read. Um, how do you think we're doing uh, as the American people? And what information strategy is being adopted to address a specific issue? Yeah, I think the American people are not doing as well as they should. Uh, just look at the, you know, the anniversary of 9-11 uh, when all of the, you know, very valid uh, intelligence reports of a potential, you know, uh, trio of, of bombers came in. I mean, just imagine 9-11, the event that we commemorated 
uh, a week ago, three airliners, or excuse me, four airliners, three specific strikes, 3,000 people killed. Now we're worried about three guys with maybe a truck bomb. Uh, had it gone off, had people been killed, that would have been a tragedy. But it's of a completely different order. So I think America has recalibrated successfully to understand that terrorism is not the existential threat that it was described as on 9-11. But I think there's still a, an, an unhealthy climate of fear from the street level and sadly all the way up to our political leadership. In our valedictory interview with Secretary Gates, he said that as he left office <coughs> finally uh, leaving public service behind, one of the things that made him saddest was that we'd become a fearful nation. Mm. And America is not a fearful nation. We're a bold nation, sometimes too bold to, to be sure, and that that fear had translated into a polarized political uh, environment where anybody who looked weak on terrorism would be criticized by the opposing party, when what you really want for strategic level threats is that bipartisanship that this country used to show at the water's edge and outward. Just to follow up on that, Eric, did you, um uh, did that information about the three guys who may be Arab and maybe American and maybe here, I mean, did it just all wash out because all these, is it still sort of a semi-plausible thing? Well, so here's the story of that information. It, what happened was this was information that came from a single source, a CIA informant in Afghanistan who had been credible in the past, and so you had to take it for what it was in that. But he was relying on a couple of what they call subsources, people who weren't as well, weren't as trusted and whose information might not be as good. So his information comes over the transom sometime Wednesday night, late Wednesday night, early Thursday morning of last week. And the, and the agency would normally have spent more time vetting this information, bouncing it off of other sources to co collaborate it uh, before they even bring it to the White House to make it known there. But because of the, the timing of this and the fear that this could be linked to a plot uh, backed up against 9-11, which is going to be on Sunday now, uh, and the fact that they knew bin Laden and Atiyah had at least talked about, if not set in motion, some type of 9-11 anniversary plot, this information had to be treated a little differently than you normally would treat your, your basic threat. And so when the, when the government came out with this statement that it was specific, credible, but unconfirmed, well, let's unpack that. Specific meaning they had specific information about as many as three individuals two of whom they believe could be U.S. citizens uh, coming into this country uh, to carry out what they believe would be some type of car or truck bomb in either Washington and or New York. They had, very, they had some information, but sketchy information about physical description of these guys, their height, their weight, roughly what they looked like, but not really enough to kind of say, oh yeah, that's John Smith or that's whoever it might be. Uh, they knew their travel, or at least, again, this is all according to the informants. So I have to be careful here. We still don't know if, if this story in itself is true or it could have been just disinformation. But the story the informant told was they started in Afghanistan, they transited through at least one or two countries in the Middle East and Europe, and then come to the United States perhaps as recently as the previous week. So now two weeks ago, about a week. So this gets put into the, uh, the hopper here. And this is at a time when the defenses of the country are already coming up. And this has been planned for months. The administration's been holding all sorts of planning on how they would increase threat levels. They would, uh, you know, you'd see more of the, the police and military presence on the streets that you saw. All that was going to happen anyway. The, the combat air patrols that some of you might have heard, uh, things like that. What was different, though, was now you had a, a very specific threat. Even though it, it couldn't be confirmed in their normal time frame, of how to deal with this. It essentially boiled down to, we're not quite sure what this is, but we can't take any chances, mm -hmm. given this is 9-11, and given all the focus on this, and given all the talk about you know, the, how much effort we've, this government has taken with other allies to prevent an attack like this. So as, as we work through the weekend, um, I'm talking to law enforcement sources in particular, and here you still have that FBI, CIA tension, uh, of some of the law enforcement people and NYPD people saying, you know, the, C the agency has been unusually candid with us, both in terms of the information and where this is coming from. So even a greater degree of transparency than you normally might see even after post 9-11, because nobody, absolutely nobody, wants to be fingered the day after a plot 
that happened on 9-11 because they withheld any information mm -hmm. at all. So they're very candid with this. The White House makes the call on, when, on Thursday. They're going to go public with this for two reasons. One is you basically are crowdsourcing this information now. <laughs> Anybody knows anything about these guys? You're putting them on alert. Uh, again, these are two U.S. citizens. So they're, what's happening within the databases of the country, they're running you know, against all these databases, names and descriptions and travel patterns, things that TSA and, and Customs and Border Patrol are doing more effectively now. They had one name, first, first name of one of the individuals named Suleiman. So you're running every Suleiman and every anywhere you can spell that name through all your computer bases and trying to track it with anybody who's traveling that way. So it's crowdsourcing, number one. Number two, it's a deterrent to the, to the plot. If it's out there at all, you're now saying, we're on to you guys. And you can see all our defenses. Well, now we're going to even redouble our efforts because we're now we're looking for you as well as anything else. Is it real or not? I mean, as of yesterday, you know, people are starting to kind of climb down from this. But they're also concerned because even before 9-11, what I was hearing from intelligence sources was no, Al-Qaeda is probably not going to try and attack right into the teeth of this defense. But what they may do is throw out a lost leader like this, something that looks like a threat but isn't, and then a couple months later, that's when the next attack is coming. When people kind of feel like they've dealt with whatever threat they might have been in, in train, but they're not, they're not anymore. And that the bigger concern they frankly had was that some whack job, some uh, lone wolf domestic threat, is some guy or woman in their basement is going to say, 9-11 anniversary, this is my time to get my 15 minutes of fame. Let me pick up a rifle and go shoot up a, a, a shopping center. You know, thankfully, that didn't happen either. But that was, that was essentially, from, from our standpoint, what we saw happening unfold over the last few days. That's very helpful. The, gen the gentleman here with the, uh, with the beard, white beard. Uh, Jim Phillips with the Heritage Foundation. Oh. And as you alluded to, uh, Al-Qaeda has killed more Muslims and non-Muslims, more Arabs and non-Arabs. And I'm wondering if, in the course of your book, you came across uh, any particularly uh, encouraging examples <coughs> of g uh, gaining uh, help or intelligence for some of our Arab and Muslim allies. I mean, as Americans, we think of 9-11, but in Jordan, they had 11-9. The uh, Jordanian intelligence, uh, as we've seen, was engaged not only in uh, Iraq, but in Afghanistan. Uh, to what extent did they help tracking down the Zarqawi? Uh, and, and, you know, as I think sometimes uh, American intelligence gets focused on shiny uh, satellites, high-tech solutions, but really to uh, eradicate and destroy al-Qaeda, I think it's going to be, uh, re require human intelligence. And uh, in there, it seems like the Arab and, and Muslim intelligence agencies have an advantage and able to uh, infiltrate, and as the top ranks of Al Qaeda are attrited, these people should be coming up. Uh, you know, have ha to what extent, uh, if you came across any, have we been helped by Egyptian intelligence? And and then finally, uh, you mentioned the Hawalis in Afghanistan. Uh, how? What's the the status on the golden chain, the big donors in Saudi Arabia? And to what extent do we have Saudi? you know, real cooperation in, in rolling up the big uh, financiers of al-Qaeda? Well, I mean, you, you've named some of the countries, both Saudi Arabia and Jordan have been very close partners in the campaign to combat violent extremism. In fact, it was intelligence from the Saudi Arabia that identified um, the printer cartridge bombs. They probably would have gotten through successfully had it not been for Saudi cooperation. Um, as far as the Saudi donors, you know, for years, Saudi Arabia was a very ambivalent partner in fighting al-Qaeda. And then, as has happened so many times, uh, terrorism in Saudi Arabia overplayed its hand. And with those attacks on the royal family, uh, Saudi Arabia certainly cracked down much more stringently on the internal financing and activists on its territory. You, you made the important point, though, about the number of innocent Muslims killed by terrorists since 9-11. Depending on whose figures you use, the UN or others, it's 80 to 85 percent of all terror victims since 9-11 have been innocent Muslims. That's a statistic that the U.S. has been very clumsy in amplifying with good reason. The U.S. shouldn't lecture the Muslim world. The military shouldn't lecture the Muslim world. It's important for you know, leaders of the Muslim world to talk to their own community about this problem. 
and while the U.S. has tried to work with them to help them amplify it, uh, anything that has fingerprints of Washington or a stamp made in the USA <coughs> will be a counterproductive message. One of the scenes in your book is uh, President Obama saying, uh, you know, getting very angry because he, um, uh, the, there's a proposal for the State Department to kind of have a, a, a voice that's countering violent extremism, and Obama is saying, you know, have, why don't we have this? It's like, you know, whatever, almost eight or nine years into this. Um, and as a result of which, there is something in the State Department that's designed to, how uh, useful is that? I mean, in terms of, uh, is it a kind of kiss of death problem that the United States gets involved in these discussions? Or if it's, if it's a message which is about, you know, they're, they're killing Muslim civilians again, is that, you know, credible coming from the United States? Or what, give your assessment of, of, of this, of this uh, development at the State Department. I, I think that that particular uh, cell, which is led by a gentleman named Ambassador Richard LeBaron, its efforts since have been announced several months ago. Uh, it's, I think they're still, you know, the results are, are still out and they're still somewhat mixed. I mean, they have been able to do kind of what Tom was saying and get Arabic speakers or Pashto speakers or some of the key languages that are spoken by the militants and try and get in this time be a little bit more proactive and go on the offensive, I think, in some of these, particularly the most vitriolic websites and chat rooms where you have not just being reactive, but getting in there and mixing it up a little bit. And that isn't covert, right? No, That's no, this is, all, this is all open. They're doing this. I mean, they've also been, they've also tried to take videos. I mean, they did this right after when the, as the Egyptian uh, Arab Spring is unfolding in Tahir Square. They're taking the statements of Zawahri, for instance, of how you need to have armed conflict is the only way to bring about the, the, the downfall of these apostates, and they're juxtaposing it in these videos they make over at the State Department or through their contractors with the scenes of the mass of humanity there in Tahir Square, where, of course, Al-Qaeda had no role whatsoever in generating that kind of support. So they're, 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 they're bit by bit with these very small efforts compared to what we see you know, in terms of a military campaign or an intelligence campaign, trying to get a niche, trying to get a foothold in at least stymieing, uh, in, engaging in the kind of conversations that Tom talked about that raise doubts, uh, putting them on the back foot so they're not out there on the offensive. The other thing the same area of, of, of the State Department is doing, this is under, uh, more broadly under Dan Benjamin's shop, the State Department's coordinator for counterterrorism, is they're trying to go out and working with the embassies and that is rather than trying to kind of fit, have one cookie cutter strategy of how do you go out in, outside uh, the United States to combat violent extremism. They're trying to finally, you know, be very tailored uh, so that you can look at local grievances almost neighborhood by neighborhood in various countries and adapt, adopt strategies working with the embassies and local NGOs uh, to try and combat the root causes of some of these things. I mean, you, one of the things they're trying to do now with small amount of grant money is in the Eastly neighborhood of Nairobi, you know, a hot, traditional hotbed of Islamist extremism in, in Kenya. And, and trying to work with community leaders there uh, to come up with a Kenyan solution to this, not an American solution, but supported by the American State Department and the embassy there. It's, 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 it, it's been very difficult, though, because, again, this is very piecemeal. It has to be done at a local level. And they haven't had a whole lot of uh, money to go after this. But it is, these are the kind of efforts, I think, long term that are going to have the kind of payback. But they have to, it, getting back to this kind of ink spot, kind of reversing the ink spot, how do you combat this on a yeah, keeping these grievances at a local level rather than allow them to, to bloom and to expand, uh, which is exactly what Al-Qaeda is trying to do, is to network these local grievances and tie it into a national and international cause. This lady here. Um, Tessa Baker, hi. Um, I have a few questions. I'll try to keep it to two. Besides Osama bin Laden's death, which is obviously a very salient component of kind of Al-Qaeda's story over the past year, there are all of these events that are occurring across MENA um, in terms of, you know, the possibility that the Muslim Brotherhood will come to power in Egypt in the elections in November, the possibility, you know, Somali government taking back control of Mogadishu and the impact on al-Shabaab and the potential for al-Shabaab to kind of face some threats there, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and Yemen with Saleh uh, handing over power potentially to his deputy. Um, so that, what does the Arab Spring kind of writ large, and I use that term loosely, mean for intelligence gathering, mean for kind of this deterrent strategy um, against violent extremist organizations in this region? And then also moving to the strategic communications aspects that you guys were just discussing, to what extent does engaging 
um, the, these jihadis on their kind of home turf potentially legitimize the jihadis themselves. And I, I want to point to um, with the Kabul attack yesterday and the day before, there was an ISAF Twitter account that was directly engaging a Taliban representative. It was picked up by the Telegraph. You know, the guy had 300 followers. The ISAF people had 12,000 followers. This 300 guy follower is now going to have bazillions more people. So to what extent by engaging these people do we not just legitimize their message and give them a better platform from which to disseminate that information. Can you hold your answer because we're running out of time and I want to get this gentleman here and also the gentleman at the, at the, in the middle there because he's been very patient. Now we can. Sure. Hi, John Grady. Just a quick question. If the big donors have dried up <coughs> on the Saudi Peninsula, how are all of these affiliates being financed and how is Al-Qaeda which had this elaborate financial schemes throughout the United, or throughout the world, how are they continuing to be financed? Okay, and then the gentleman in the check shirt. Thank you, Salvatore Chandra, University of Maryland. Um, you spoke at great length about the significance of uh, cyberspace for command and control of terrorist groups. Could you speak of the continuing relevance for physical um, areas like? Pakistan, Yemen, for uh, command and control of terrorist groups. Great. Sure. Um, I'll start on the Arab Spring. And again, we're here in Washington, <laughs> and we have colleagues who are living and working there who are two of the experts. But I guess I'm, right now, I'm in the, the glass half empty mode. Um, mm -hmm. The wonderful excitement and energy that started the Arab Spring clearly proved that Al Qaeda what could be viewed as irrelevant. You know, an organization that said, only through violent extremism can you rid yourself of the yoke of despotic leaders. Well, that was disproven by just, you know, the energy and the commitment of all of the, these young people. My concern now, as the Arab Spring comes into autumn and winter, pardon the metaphor, um, is there's a gap between the expectations of last spring and a reality that at least is uncomfortable, maybe even failing on the ground. And into that gap <coughs> between reality and expectations is a lot of space for Al Qaeda to operate. And so I think they do have tactical advantages to return. And we have to say as well that some of those despotic leaders who've been deposed were allies and partners of the American government in this campaign. So some of those lines of communication have, have been broken. As far as your question about does engaging, you know, elevate these guys, um, if you read our book, uh, you will not think that we believe this government's any good at strategic communications. Um, to talk on the funding issue, uh, I don't think uh, all the donors have been dried up. I think the, the Saudis and other governments have done a better job at going after these, but they're still out there. And I, I point you to the WikiLeaks documents uh, that, uh, that we reported on. And, and I remember writing a story for the Times looking at the really blistering language that uh, State Department uh, diplomats had four officials in Qatar and Kuwait. Uh, mm. And today, even Treasury, it doesn't take much to get a Treasury Department official to say something even on the record in, in terms of these are key allies, of course, uh, with, uh, with US forces uh, being based in both countries. And yet, there's great frustration on border on anger of this government that the, that the Kuwaiti and Qatari governments have not done enough to crack down on these donors. Their legislatures uh, have not done enough to pass the kind of laws uh, that would make these type of activities illegal in the country. So I think there is still uh, quite a source of uh, revenue coming uh, out of those countries. And Saudi Arabia is a big place. Even though the Saudis have made great strides uh, in combating the financing there, uh, they're working much more closely uh, with the Americans. There are actually Treasury Department officials in Riyadh working side by side in a special counterterrorism finance cell uh, that they operate in this. There are still a lot of people in Saudi Arabia who are able to get money uh, to these causes. Uh, and so it's, it's just a matter of kind of keep focusing. I, if I understood the, the last question correctly, the question of is physical control of a place still important? Absolutely. All you have to do is look at a place like North Waziristan in Pakistan. This is an area, as we, we talked a little bit about in our discussion, where the Pakistanis have said essentially we can't go in there and pick your choice, you know, pick your reason. Either they, they're, we're spread too thin everywhere else uh, to go in there in the tribal areas, or more likely the idea they go in there, they, they're, they're taking on a very determined enemy if they go in there 
and the idea that that, that could both be a backlash against them uh, in, in terms of attacks throughout the rest of Pakistan and the threat, of course, that they could, they could lose. The army could go in there and, get, and, and, and face some kind of defeat. And so there, there's a lot of concerns there on top of the, you know, the suspicions, of course, that because the ISI is so close to some of these uh, terrorist networks, they have no interest in going after them. Uh, you look at Yemen right now and the territory that uh, AQAP physically has been able to take. And now, interestingly enough, how uh, officials are saying, American officials are saying they're actually not just uh, interested in, in, in driving out the, uh, the Iranian and Yemeni security forces, but now they're actually t taking and holding territory in Yemen and kind of starting to set up as, as the Taliban has in parts of Afghanistan, kind of a parallel government, if you will. It's not nearly as developed, of course, as Afghanistan is, but territory where plotters can continue to plot. And that's one of the big concerns there. I mean, John Brennan said a couple times last week that counterterrorism cooperation with the Yemeni government hasn't been, has never been any better than it is today. Well, it's kind of like saying the Yemeni government used to control this whole building and we could, would try and cooperate them in rooting out the extremists that were infiltrated. And now they basically control this room. Well, yeah, they're going to be cooperating because that's the last, <laughs> this is the Alamo here, folks. We're going to be cooperating because the government faces that kind of pressure right now. But to say that cooperation's improved is a little bit misleading, I think. And then finally, the, the, one of the questioners mentioned Somalia, which is a really interesting trend. What's happened here is, is the Shabaab is, has basically been pushed out by an African Union peacekeeping force uh, that, um, that's been there now several years, about 9,000 troops, that has actually gotten pretty good at, uh, at doing this kind of urban warfare after some just disastrous uh, uh, engagements initially. They're still learning, but they've actually got uh, more seasoned troops that are coming in from Burundi and Uganda. They've got more seasoned commanders uh, pushing them there. Uh, you've got a number of, of, of kind of quietly American contractors who are working there as well, doing some training. The big question there is Shabab still controls a lot of the territory outside of Mogadishu area. And the big prize, of course, for them is Kismayo. The port of Kismayo is where they derive most of their revenue in terms of port fees and all that. So that's going to be the next target. I mean, if, if they can break Shabab's lock on, on Kismayo in that port, then I think you'll really see a turnaround in Somalia. But still, I mean, it's still a very much of a country with, with just the, the most fledgling of governments. I want to thank Eric and Tom for a very stimulating thank you, Peter. Uh, presentation. Thank you. And, uh,